There comes a time when we all take breath And who we are with all the violence Stand there and tremble and hope for the best Knowing it's out of our hands But if it's amazing grace That
If all these things are true, then why does it seem so difficult to live the Christian life? Why is it hard for me to just move forward and grow? And Why does it seem like such a struggle? And so I hope this morning uh, we can address that with you and maybe uh, give you a little bit of help along the way. The title of the sermon, Why We Struggle. Let's read 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice insomuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, on their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, and I thank you for an opportunity uh, to help your children. And I confess this morning, Father, that without the aid and help of the Holy Ghost of God, it's impossible for me, the Lord is a mere man, to minister to them, to help them, to encourage them, Lord, to give them spiritual food that would maintain their uh, walk with you. And I, I ask you today that you would do for them, God, what only you can do, that you would uh, encourage their heart, that you would answer some questions that are on their mind, and that you might minister grace unto the hearer. Lord, help us to be able to edify believers today and to build them up so that they might become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, again, for the unsaved, draw them, Lord, so that they might meet you this day as their Lord and their Savior. Have your way in this service. Lord, we commit it into your trust and, and we ask that you would work a great work in Jesus' name. We pray and ask these things. Amen. Recently, I've been reading a book uh, the title is The Christian in Complete Armor. Anybody ever read that book? The Christian in Complete Armor by a Puritan named William Grinnell. And in that, uh, he is, it's actually a three-volume set. So if you think I'm long-winded or I take a long time in going through a short passage, he's just talking about the Christian armor and he's got three books on it. So you might want to give me a little bit of a break. <laughs> I've got a book in my office about that thick on just John 17. So I'm pretty short-winded when it comes to some other individuals. So some of the points in this sermon are birthed out of that. Um, and it's been a help to me to read some of the things that he has written. But I've, I've thought about this as a Christian myself. I don't know if you have. I remember being a a young Christian and thinking about why is it so hard to you know, live this Christian life? We were trying to help a man in our neighborhood. He uh, used to live just down the road. Um, he had a problem with drug addiction. I believe it was, if I remember correctly, it was crack cocaine. And, and he had just struggled and, and went through a difficult time and he made a profession of faith. And 
and uh, he was trying to live for Christ. And one day, Brenda and I were living in the trailer here on the property. He came and knocked frantically at the door and and uh, opened the door, and he just came right on in the house, and he said, why is it so hard to live the Christian life? <laughs> he said, it's impossible. You think he was struggling? I think he was. But I reminded him, the Bible said, the way of the transgressor is hard. Now, you think it's difficult to live for Jesus, let me remind you, this world doesn't have anything to offer you. Remember, you fled that so that you could come to Christ. <laughs> there was something there that you realized you need to get away from. Amen? And it is far more joyous to be a Christian, even a struggling Christian, than a hell-bound sinner that could be dropped into that eternal lake of fire forever and ever at any moment. Amen? And so why do we struggle? The Bible gives us so many promises when it comes to the Christian life. Remember in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Amen? Isn't that a great verse? I believed on Christ and He gave me power to live the Christian life. And without Christ, I can't live the Christian life. But He's empowered me to live the Christian life. I remember witnessing to another man, and he said, Tommy, it's difficult. I mean, how can I live this life this way? And I said, I said, listen, it's not you that live it by yourself. The Bible says Christ in you. I said, Christ lived a sinless life, didn't He? Yes. And I said, do you know what He's offering you? He's offering to move inside of your heart and take up residence there. Do you think Christ living in you can empower you to live a Christian life? Amen and amen. First Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 says this, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's an amen right there that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in, in, in the world through lust. Listen to Romans 8 and verse 37. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Amen? We're not just conquerors. Not just conquerors, that's good. I mean, to be a conqueror, amen, that's great. But we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. 1 John 4 and verse 4 says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that, isn't that a great verse that says, to be a Christian, you have promised power from God. You have great power residing in you. Power to overcome the world, power to overcome the flesh, and power even to crush the head of Satan himself. Amen? Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. You see, when you were born again, you didn't just sign up to be a church member. You didn't just join a group of people. Amen? Amen. The Spirit of the living God came to make uh, abode in your life. We sing a song sometimes here at church, He abides. He abides. Hallelujah. He abides in me. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan, right? But I'm going to send the Comforter. And when He has come, He'll guide you into all truth. What's the word Comforter mean? It's one who comes alongside. You say, preacher, I can't live a Christian life. I know that, 
And that's why God is giving you the Comforter to help you along the way. And there are many other great promises like these. Isn't that right? And when you read those promises, you maybe say, like me sometimes, how does any Christian ever <laughs> struggle? How do we ever have any difficulty or problems? Well, these promises don't erase our problems. Let me give you just a couple more quick. Colossians 1.27 says, which is Christ in you, the latter portion of that uh, verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory. James 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Listen, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Is that not a promise or not? Amen. That means you can shoo the devil off, and he'll have to run. <laughs> Have you ever met a Christian and said, well, that devil, he's wearing me out. You know, he's just giving me a fit. He's wearing me out. When's the last time you heard a Christian say, you know what, the devil started bothering me and I kicked him out of the house. I ran him off. I stood against him. I resisted him. And he ran out of the house scared as he could be. You don't hear that a lot, do you? But this is a promise that we have power to make Satan flee. And so all these promises, and by the way, many, many other promises, talk about this great power that God has given to us as Christians, yet the truth is, you and I all know that sometimes living the Christian life, it is a struggle. It is hard. Sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? Uh, sometimes you and I sin. We fall flat on our face. We, we sometimes act in such a way that even our own conscience makes us think, well, have you ever truly been saved or not? Have you ever felt like that? And you just felt in such an awful way, you thought, have you ever even met Christ? Do you know anything about God? I mean, if you did, how in the world could you do something like that? And by the way, Satan loves to echo that. Amen? So let me give you a few things, reasons why we struggle. First of all, because we are unaware. And by that I mean we're unaware of all that God has done for us. We only see some of the things that we face in life, but we cannot see all the grace that God has given to us. And by the way, that grace that He's given to us has brought us this far to this day. Amen? Amen? I mean, you're not out there in the world running from God. God's grace has been sufficient for you that it's got you this far up to this point. Amen? Amen. It's one thing when we see a definite answer to prayer, it's easy to give God glory for that. But what we don't see is the many unseen acts of love that God is doing behind the scenes for us. I think about the nation of Israel when God delivered them from Egyptian bondage. You know, they could have went really straight path, but you know what God said? I'm not going to send you down that straight path. Why? Because there's some strong enemies in the way, and so I'm going to send you on a longer path because I don't want you to get in those battles right now and get discouraged. So they're out here going the long way around, right? And some of them are, why do we go this way? Why, why do we take this route? Isn't there a better route? Some of them probably thought, hey, there's a quicker route. But they didn't realize the route that God put them on was a grace route. It was a protecting route. It was the route that was best for them. They didn't see it, but God was at work behind the scenes. Isn't that true? And I just want to remind you, He's doing the same thing in your life as well. We get to see great heroes of the faith, right? But we get to see what they were not able to see themselves. We forget when we read the Bible, we've already read what would happen. But when they were walking through it, they didn't have a clue. We talked this morning in Sunday school about Abraham who received the promise of having a child. 
With him and Sarah when he was 75 years old. He didn't have the child until he was 100. 25 years there, he didn't see the hand of God. He didn't see what God was doing. He didn't understand the purposes of God. Well, was God sitting on the backside of the universe doing nothing? No. He was present and active in all the details of Abraham's life. And I want you to know He is your heavenly Father and He is present and active in every detail of your life as well. How much does He care for you? How much does He think about you? He cares about you so much that in Matthew chapter 10 it records that He knows every hair that's on your head. I mean, He knows every detail of your life. He has not abandoned you. He is doing some great works and gracious works. And sadly, too often we are not aware and alert. My pastor used to say that if we only knew the great things God had done for us, we would worship Him a lot more. When we get to heaven, we'll see all the little turns that He did in our life in a sovereign way And we didn't understand it at that time. We didn't even know what was happening. But in heaven we'll see, oh Lord, you were being merciful to me. No wonder I lost that job. No wonder you directed me a different way. Because if I had continued to go that way, I would have been in a mess spiritually. He's in charge. Remember that. We're a lot like the children of Israel in the wilderness, right? Manna was given every morning. That was miracle bread. Bread don't just appear outside the tent in a normal way, right? You know what? Every time that bread appeared, it was an assurance. I am with you. I am protecting. I am providing. I am your God. Do you think that they responded that way to that bread? That wasn't what they responded to at all. I mean, every day he's showing himself caring, providing, guiding. And they just go up, out blindly, get the bread up and take it to the house. Sometimes we're the same way. God is providing for us today a present grace. Just as real as going outside and picking up that manna, that what is it? That's what the bread is. They said, well, what is it? And that's what manna means. What is it? It's the grace of God. And God is providing for you what is it every day. And so sometimes we're struggling and we're going through hard times and we don't realize that God is really with us and He is working and blessing and protecting and guiding Just because you're in the heat of the fire doesn't mean that He's not with you. Don't look at the struggle. Look at the Savior. And realize He will never leave you nor forsake you no matter how hot the battle is, no matter how big the problem, right? He is with you and He will always be with you. And sometimes when that struggle comes, we're unaware. We're studying this in our Sunday school class in Numbers chapter 14, and it's compared to Hebrews chapter 3, and it says, Today if you'll hear His voice, and it says, I want to tell you about the children of Israel, what they did. They they did not listen when God spoke. So in Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I do show among them? And I just want to remind you that God has demonstrated His reality to you, His presence to you, His power to you. He's answered your prayers. Amen? I mean, how much more could He do to demonstrate that He is a very present help in a time of need than what He's already done for you. And as He worked and did things for these Israelites, you know how they responded? They responded in unbelief. 
Listen to this verse and listen closely. Exodus 17, verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa. That means proof or testing. That's when they, they left Egypt. By the way, ten plagues. And none of those plagues touched them. I mean, that would have been a wild moment, right? Wow, God is really dealing with them, but He's protecting us. Amen. And then He parted the Red Sea. Amen? Amen. And then when that army came into the Red Sea, He closed up the sea on them and drowned the entire army. Now, how many of us would say, Whew, wow, that is a great God. And they make a few more days' journey and they come to a place where there's no water and they go to drink the water and it's brackish water. It's, it's got salt in it. They can't drink it. And you know what they do? They get on their face and they say, God, you sent ten plagues. You parted the Red Sea. This water problem is no problem for you because we trust you. No. <laughs> it was a place of testing and proving. And you know what they did? They failed the test. They said, Moses, you just brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die of thirst. We'd have been better off to stay in Egypt. And God pointed out the tree and Moses put the tree in the water and God turned that undrinkable water into water that satisfied their thirst. But he called the place Meribah. That means the place of contention. They were, they were arguing with God. And listen to what the verse goes on to say. Because of the chiding of the children of Israel. Listen closely. Because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? How many times have you uttered that same complaint? Lord, are you with, are you with us or not? Where are you at? Show yourself. Well, I showed myself with ten plagues. I showed myself with parting of the Red Sea. I mean, how many more times do I have to prove to you that I am God? And by the way, that wasn't the end of their complaining, was it? You know what God called that? He called that tempting Him. We need to get to a place where we say whether we're in Egypt whether we're passing through the Red Sea, whether we're on the other side, whether we're drinking brackish water, whether there's no bread, or if there's manna coming down from heaven, God is with us. He's in charge. We can trust Him. I'm trying to say we struggle sometimes because we're unaware of all that God is doing for us. Again, His grace has brought you this far. Amen? Remember Job. Job was completely unaware of what God was doing. He didn't have insight to the conversation that Satan had with Yahweh, did he? He didn't know the devil went up there and said, well, I've been looking on the earth and there's no one that wants to serve you. And the, God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, yeah, but you've got a hedge about it. And God said, well, I'll take that hedge away. I want to show you that I have a faithful servant. And then all the problems afflict this man. And they come from nowhere. And in a day, his life is turned upside down and inside out. But through, that, through all of it, God was still in charge. He put restrictions on the devil. He said, yeah, you can touch everything he has, but you can't touch his body. And Satan comes back and said, I tell you what, you can touch his body, but you cannot take his life. And God limits what Satan can do in your life as well. So even if you're struggling and you're suffering and things look terrible and horrible, I want you to see that God is on the throne, he's in charge, and he is still working. Don't just trust him when things are going well. Trust Him even when things are not going well. Amen? Amen. Remember this promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. You're not going to face anything that other men have not faced. And by the way, other Christian people have faced the same thing you face. 
And some of those Christian people soared through it victoriously. And God received the glory for that. Amen? And some Christians didn't fare as well. But it wasn't God's fault. He's with you even when you're struggling. And sometimes, secondly, you may be unlearned. Not, not just that you have un, an unawareness, you don't see what God is doing. Maybe you have not studied enough to realize that Christians face difficult times. If you're expecting a Christianity that promises no problems whatsoever, let me tell you something, you're not going to find that. Somehow you need to go to the Bible and learn, even as a Christian, I may face some difficult things in my life. Are y'all with me on that? Amen. But just because I'm going through difficulty doesn't mean that God is not still with me and blessing me. We only think that God is blessing us when we're getting what we want. That's a, per, that's a poor, selfish view of Christianity, isn't it? I think the problem is so many prosperity preachers in our day. You want a Cadillac? Just claim it. You want, you want to be rich? Just say it. and It'll be so. You want this? Just pronounce it. And God has to do what you said that He was going to do. No. He's the Creator. We bow before Him and we say, Lord, not my will, but be done, right? And I challenge you to learn what the Bible says about suffering. Here, even in 1 Peter, Beloved, think it not strange concerning fiery trials. Now, does that sound like a, you know, a comfortable, easy time? <laughs> That sounds like you're in the furnace and you're being purified and it hurts and it's hot and it's difficult but it's necessary in order for you to become the person God designed for you to be in Christ. It has to be this way. So sometimes we're just unlearned. We don't know what God is doing. In order for us to learn how to defeat the devil, the Lord allows us to have some sparring matches with him. You know that? I mean, every once in a while he says, okay, I'll let you go in there, but don't you do any un uh, underblows. Don't you hit him in the face. <laughs> I mean, you got, you're restricted. You can only do this. And, and we get in there and we struggle and we fight. And we learn how to defeat the devil. I mean, if you've ever had a little child, you know, they're first born, boy, you just hold them tight and you love them. But then it gets to a point where you have to start letting them try to walk. Remember holding their hands up and they're just... <laughs> and then, some, then there's that time when you let those hands go. And what happens nearly 100% of the time? Poof! And God holds our hands. And guess what? Sometimes we fall. Just because you struggle with sin doesn't mean that God is not with you. Now some of the greatest lessons I've learned is when I fail. And God said, Tommy, you're always going to fail until you trust me. You can't live a Christian life by yourself. And so sometimes we have to fall before we realize, listen, Jesus, I need you to overcome the devil and I need you to overcome even the desires of my flesh. I can't do, I can't live this Christian life without you. Amen? So God is allowing these things to come in your life in order to strengthen you, not so that you would be defeated or discouraged. That's not His purpose. His purpose is to strengthen you. Let me warn you about this real quickly since we're running out of time. Thirdly, we struggle because sometimes of our unbelief. We won't accept the promises God has given to us. And if we won't accept His help, guess what? We will struggle if we won't accept His help. He has made available to us all the resources that we need. 
And if we don't avail ourselves of those, of those, of those graces, then it's not God's fault that we're struggling because we're not doing those things He's instructed us to do. Isn't that right? Sometimes it's because of our own belief. Just like Israel refused to enter into the promised land. Remember what God said to them? I've got a land for you. Oh, it's a great land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And I've given it to you. And I will go with you and I will defeat the enemies for you. You're going to have to fight, but I'm going to lead in the battle. And some of them I'm going to just drive out with hornets and bees. And, and I've given you the land. It's your land. And when it, time, when it came time to cross over, what did they do? They said, we can't cross over. I mean, look at those big cities and giants. And, and look at our little tiny army. We, we can't do it. And that generation died wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because of unbelief. You and I have to get to a place where we realize that God is serious about what He said and you can trust what He said and you have to step out on those promises. I mean, look even at your prayer life. When's the last time you prayed and you expected an answer to your prayers? You know how much of our praying is just, Lord, thank You for the day and thank You for this and that and there's no real anticipation of an answer? Is that how we're taught to pray in the Bible? If you pray like that, you're always going to be a weak Christian. You need to get to a place where you see a promise in the Bible and you say, God, you said that's your will for my life. <laughs> I want that. And I claim that. And I trust you that it'll be exactly what you said it would be. Do you understand what I'm saying about that? I'm not talking about making God's will your will. I'm talking about... Let me restate that. <laughs> I'm not saying making God do what you want Him to do, but I am saying you make His will the will for your life. We got that model in 1 John chapter 5, right? Verses 14 and 15. If we pray according to His will, we know what? We know He hears us. And what else do we know? We know we have the petition that we desired of Him. It's God's will that you be sanctified completely, body, soul, and spirit. Isn't that true? So a proper prayer to that verse would be, Lord, sanctify me entirely, completely, wholly, body, soul, and spirit. Help that my entire being would be set apart for your use only. Now, Lord, I don't know how to make that happen, but you do. And that's what you desire of my life, and that's what I'm asking you to do for me. Make me completely yours. And I promise you, He'll work in your life and things will start changing. Amen? Amen. Do you see that? Sometimes we struggle because we don't believe. Sometimes we let Satan just come around and beat on us and beat on us and beat on us and beat on us and God said, I want you to resist him and he will flee from you. So in other words, sometimes we struggle because we won't stand on the Word of God and believe the Word of God. Isn't that true? God has promised us victory over the devil. Is that true or not? He's also promised us victory over our own flesh. Is that true or not? Amen. Listen to Romans chapter 6, verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Freed from sin. He that is dead, and that's talking about being baptized into Christ and dying with Christ. He said because you died with Christ, you're free from sin. You know how many times you read Romans chapter 6 and if you're like me, especially when I was a young Christian, I thought, <laughs> that ain't what I'm experiencing. <laughs> it don't seem like I'm free at all. Now I've got a choice to make, don't I, Brother John? Am I going to believe what Christ said in Romans 6, that I am free? Or am I going to believe my experience? 
what I'm facing. He goes on to say that you're to reckon yourself dead and deed unto sin, but alive unto God. You are to yield to that truth. And is that is that right or not? And when we yield to that truth, guess what? We experience the power of Christ. Even over some of those things that we struggle with that are temptations and sin. When's the last time you brought a sin that you struggle with to the feet of Christ and say, Christ, I don't have the power in myself without you to overcome this, but you have enough power to overcome that in my life, and I need your help. Can I testify something? If you do that, He will deliver you. By the way, He promised that He would deliver you. Amen? Amen. I'm saying sometimes we struggle... And, and we're past the time, but let me just say this quickly. Sometimes we struggle because God wants us to be an exceptional example of grace. Sometimes He allows you to struggle so that others can look at your life and see, wow, if, if she would serve Jesus in such a difficult life like that, boy, that makes me want to serve Jesus myself. Amen. I mean, you've seen preachers that have challenged you, haven't you? I, I, I saw a preacher recently go to a prison. has no legs and no arms. And he's on a table, walking back and forth on the table, preaching to prisoners. And I'm thinking, if that, that man could serve Christ like he's serving Christ, what excuse do I have? Is it David Ring, the preacher that has... Um, cerebral palsy or something like that and he said I can't even say Jesus what's your problem yeah. Amen. and he's, he, he said when he was called to preach everybody said you can't preach because you, you can't even hardly talk he said listen God called me that's what he told me to do and do you know how God has greatly blessed that ministry as a testimony if someone can go through all of that and still love God with all his heart and serve God, what a challenge that is to me. Amen. And that's why sometimes God lets some of you go through greater difficulties in life. Amen. It's not always going to take the problems away, by the way. I promise you, I'm closing now. This is Paul's like <laughs> He's in the third chapter and he's got two more. Finally, my brethren... <laughs> You look at the life of Jesus and that's the kind of life you should expect as a Christian. What kind of life did he have? He was a man acquainted with sorrow. He was afflicted. He was despised and he was rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Was his life an easy life? No. They said you're a demon. They tried to throw him off a cliff. They tried several times to stone him. He was hated, ridiculed, and despised. Now listen, that is God in the flesh. If they treated Jesus that way, you shouldn't expect to be treated any different in this world. If you want to see what the Christian life is really like, look at Jesus. You know how he ended, right? Ultimately, he took a cross, a heavy cross up a skull-shaped hill, laid down on that cross, was nailed to it, and he suffered and bled and died so that you and I could have eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. Now, he didn't promise you that it would be easy, but he promised you with every struggle, there's a purpose behind it. Every difficulty, every fight, every failure, God is actively working in your life. And if you would believe the Bible about that, you would participate more and experience more God Himself by saying, Lord, even in your sin, Lord, without you, that's all I can do anyway. And I don't want to live that way. I don't like that. I, I'm sorry for sin. But Lord, it just sh it shows me again how much I need you in order to be victorious. Amen? Let me ask you today, come to Jesus. If you don't know Him as your Savior and your Lord, you need to come because today is the day of salvation. There's no promise that you'll see the sun rise in the morning or you'll even make it home today. Amen? Amen. Come to Christ and be saved. And if you're a Christian, anticipate struggles. They're going to come your way. 
But trust God. He's working. He's, he loves you. He's present. He cares for you. Amen? He'll never abandon you. So no matter what you go through, you can trust Him. Amen? Let's stand for a word of prayer.